to this session uh, that we're running today for uh, AbilityNet and TechShare Pro. And thank you ever so much for inviting me uh, to host these sessions for you. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we are available for you within Teams today. So if you're using the desktop version, you can access it there. Um, if you're using the web version, um, that might not work quite so well for you. So we recommend that maybe you try using Teams via a mobile at the same time, and that can provide you with your captions. So I'm Lucy Rook. I'm the Task Force Manager at Business Disability Forum. And for those of you that don't know us, we're a non-for-profit organisation who help businesses to become disability smart by optimizing what their disabled colleagues can do for them and also to be able to provide their services to everyone which is what we all want um i noticed a, a thing we're doing at tech share pro this year is a kind of a, a audio description of who we are and what we look like um i'm a, a white female in my mid 40s and i'm wearing a blue top um what none of you can't see today is I'm also a right leg below knee amputee. So luckily we're from the sort of neck up, which is a bonus. Um, about today in this session. So uh, as we'll all know, the last eight months, the world has kind of changed for us, I think it's fair to say. Business has had to adapt and become more flexible, allowing those who are able to, to work from home. And it's been a big shift for everyone, but potentially more so for our disabled colleagues. So what has the impact been and what have been the major issues and actually is some of this a good thing maybe? So during this session we're going to have a bit of a panel discussion and I'll introduce you to the panel in a little bit. But before we do that, um, I wanted to kind of give you a personal story and someone's own experience of what this has been like um, and give us a bit of an intro sort of we do a sort of a Scooby-Doo moment maybe heading back to sort of March time I think and you to share his story and also Neil if you could start off by giving us a bit of an audio description as well of yourself and then and then fire off if that's okay yeah absolutely you mean 21 and gorgeous yeah and I'm actually a, a white male of older years uh, with white cropped hair and a salt and pepper droopy moustache that's only here in November each year um, I'm wearing a brown round neck to jumper and glasses so before COVID, uh, at KPMG, we were offered the opportunity to work from home for some of the week if we wished. And I always said, no thanks. Uh, I thought I would hate it. I love dealing with people, felt I needed the office environment to help me do my job well. When I realised that COVID-19 was coming our way and the danger that it posed for my wife, uh, because she was, uh, she was in the, the vulnerable group, I, uh, I just grabbed my stuff and I ran. Now, I'm lucky in home what I needed, my screens, my laptop, my external keyboard. I set myself up at home, fortunate again that I had the space to do that. Um, all help because my wife still caught COVID um, and she went into hospital, terrible time. Um, but then when she came out from hospital, I caught COVID and I spent weeks off work. Um, lucky again that I was allowed to put this to a COVID time code and not having to put it down to sick leave. But as time went by and um, I returned to work, things have not exactly settled down. My father-in-law went into a home, then he died. Uh, my health's not as strong as it was before all of this uh, started off and the continuing enforced remote working situation is trying to play with my mental well-being. So here we are, trying about a year to get over 2020. So how's that for an intro? It's a pretty dramatic story, I think, Neil, isn't it really? Um, and uh, personal as well so um, genuinely really thank you for that um, and I think it's a really interesting example of how it's affected all of us and even though we can try you know at the beginning of this you really try to avoid it you were able to work from home that that didn't quite pay off um, so I'd now like to move on to a bit of our, our panel discussion and uh, 
everyone here today who's with us is a, a member of the Business Disability Forum's Technology Task Force. Um, if you'd like to know a bit more about what we do, I won't give you the sales pitch now, it's fine, but you can go and visit our virtual booth in the Expo Hall. So what I'd like you all to do is uh, to introduce yourselves and uh, give us a, a bit of an audio description as well, if you can. Sarah, I'm going to come to you first. Thank you very much, Lucy. So I'm Sarah John. I at NatWest Group. Uh, I'd like to say I'm uh, a blonde 21-year-old female supermodel, but that's not true. I am blonde um, with some hairdresser help, um, and I celebrated before lockdown, so I managed to get out for dinner. Um, and um, I've worked for NatWest Group for 15 years in various project management roles, and then after maternity leave, I led a project in the technology department to make them more disability smart and I'm really passionate about accessibility so I have never looked back from then. Um, but thank you for having me today, looking forward to the questions and discussion. Thank you Sarah. Um, Michael, can I come to you next to introduce yourself please and that little audio description as well please? Okay, my name is Michael Vermeersh, uh, I work for Microsoft, I'm in consulting services I'm the, the digital inclusion lead, making sure that we do digital inclusion in our products and services. Uh, I'm also the chair of our employees at Microsoft UK. Um, my audio description, I'm looking slightly less handsome than I normally look because I just had the titanium bars drilled into my left jaw, which is a bit puffy. Having a lot of pain as well, but I'm just trying to get the sympathy for it here. I'm wearing uh, uh, my lucky purple shirt. Uh, I mean, I could say, guess my age. I have got three grandchildren, so I'm not going to say my age, uh, but I look awfully young because I drink a lot of water. There you are. Fantastic. Thank you for that intro, Michael. And uh, Darren, if I could come to you as well, please. Sure, put that into in intro. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Darren Rowan. I'm a programmer at Eli Lilly and Company, a pharmaceutical company. And I also am the leader of our Enable Employee Resource Group and leading our Global Accessibility Initiative at Lilly. Uh, to describe myself, so, well, um, so I'm a little year older than that now. I'm white, feeling paler every day as I'm stuck in my dark room. I'm visually impaired, um, so I, I, I do get the audio description piece. And I'm wearing a blue shirt. Lovely. Thank you, everyone, for your intros. It's always interesting how people describe themselves. I did a brief session at the start of the day today, and uh, we were talking about the Microsoft app seeing AI and how that ages you. And uh, myself and the uh, the woman on the panel uh, had been aged much younger. It took 20 years off me, which I was very happy with. But for some reason, it seems to put men's ages up, and I'm not quite sure why. Maybe there's some clever AI designers in there who've gone flatter females. And I don't. Anyway, let's not go there. We'll, we'll park that one for the time being. So. Um, I've got some questions that uh, I've already prepared that I'd really like to run through with you today. But also, I mean, the interesting thing about doing things online is I'd really be interested for other um, I don't want you to do, be too prepared. I'd like to sort of mix things up a little bit. So if you're watching this and you've got any questions that you'd like to ask, please do post those either in the chat or on slide. TSP20, so Tech Share Pro, TSP20. So please do post those and then we'll, we'll try and get to those um, in a little while. So the first question um, is around that sort of working from home and uh, that working from home has been a, a big shift, um, kind of for some of us, but not for all of us. Some of us were working from home before that and I include um, myself in that and I know other people in this group. Um, but what have been some of the technology that's really allowed people to connect and thinking obviously with this with a, a disability lens, uh, what are the accessibility pros and cons with these? Would anyone like to fire us off with um, their thoughts on that? I know there's like three questions in each question, which I, I have realised as I read them through today. Um, anyone want to get us? A... Yeah, yeah, Neil, thank you. So um, from uh, the... IT side of things, T Teams has been good for us and Skype for business. Uh, and we've also 
they, even though we were already looking at accessibility options within various applications, the enforced working from home brought a sharper focus to these things. So thankfully, more urgency to get things fixed. So, um, so that, that, was a, that was quite a, a good start. Yeah, Michael, you, sorry. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so, so for us, actually, so before the pandemic and before the uh, enforced working from home, I, I, I would typically spend two days working from home. Uh, I think at Microsoft, we, we do have that enabling technology and, and we are very blessed to have that full integrated software. And, and Neil mentions that te Teams, for example, the extra benefit that we an enterprise disability answer desk where uh, you know when when there's some things that you want specifically sorted out for yourself individualized that we could have that support as well mere fact because of the volume and the requirement that we are now all working in these circumstances has has accelerated the technology where I, I remember in the very beginning of the pandemic, we didn't have raise your hands yet uh, and, and we didn't have speaker attribution. So we actually had an acceleration of that technology into our products uh, to make sure that we, we can do this working from home and, and virtual collaborating even better. Um, so, so in that sense, very really good. Um, but uh, are we already on, on the, the not so necessarily good things. Um, yeah, go for it, Michael. Um, you know, technology also we've seen, and we started to use that more as well. Uh, and for example, in workplace, and we're working, and and where the boundaries should be, whether we should have a bit more time for ourselves. Technology was already helping there, but uh, and and when you get more and more through the pandemic. But what, what, what I also have seen is that technology in itself is not enough. Uh, and, and that could, you know, that could be a discussion in itself, if that makes sense. We, um, humans can break the technology as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I think we'll probably come on to that in a little bit as well. Um, Darren, I'm aware you wanted to come in on this question. Yeah, um, um, like yourself, Lucy, I, I've been working from home for a while. I, I truly started from the middle of last year permanently working from home um, and that's really because of my role being a global one and I was traveling into an office when I found that I was really on teams most of the day um, so it just made more sense for me so it wasn't a kind of culture shock in a sense um, when, when all this happened it's like Microsoft Teams have been you know, vital for us as a company and, and also things like internally social media, you know, Yammer, things like that. We've seen an uptake in the engagement in, in that connection with one another. I think in terms of accessibility, I, I would see Teams is just improving all the time. You know, it's not perfect. And there's some times when I will use the app on my phone uh, rather than the application on my desktop for things like chatting because I find it more accessible and quicker um, but for other things it's you know getting around and, and finding where your things are for me it makes sense for some people maybe I've had reports from people with ADHD they struggle more with it because there's too much going on so you know when one person finds it and, and a quote this morning as we were preparing for uh, an internal webinar somebody said oh are we using Teams for this and not the other one? And said, yeah, and he said, oh, it's great. And it's, so, Michael, you can have that one for your Microsoft strap line uh, next time around. But, um, you know, I, I think that when people share their screens and things like that, obviously the team these days for your screen reader to be able to interpret that. So we, we still rely on the people who are on that call to be inclusive as well. Absolutely. Um, Sarah, if I can come to you as well next, please. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think the, the fact that we've had Teams and other video conferencing type um, technology has been brilliant. It's, it's definitely connected people. Um, but um, as we've also sort of picked out, um, the fact that everyone's on meetings all day isn't great from our mental health point of view. And um, so we're trying to encourage people to actually just 
think, do I really need a meeting to answer this? Or can I send an email? Can I do a, use a different part of technology to contact somebody? Um, and I think there's the contact with you. So sometimes when you were in the office and you were in a meeting room, no one would disturb you. Whereas now you're in an isolated space and people are pinging you left, right and centre. Um, and off perspective and focusing. So I think people need to, to sort of think about how technology and how to manage the technology in that respect. Um, and also a big thing for us that we picked out on with some of the colleagues, um, um, many that have got um, sort of dyslexia, are the different learning styles. Um, so when we were in the office before, people could get to their colleague and say, could you show me how to work that bit of technology, please? Can you just show me how that, that works? And sit next to someone. And, and we haven't got that so easily now. And I think it's, um, it's great that we've got then the sharing capability. You can share your desktop, but that's another piece of technology for people to come to terms with and how they use it. So for me, um, I think the big learning for, from a COVID perspective is just think about the different ways people learn. Uh, and the different ways and the need uh, and try and sort of um, work for all of those really uh, in the best way that you can do with technology. Did, I didn't quite get a con side to my... Uh, I think one of the con sides that, um, that I was looking at was how do you deliver assistive technology to people in the first place? Because one of the things we had to do very quickly when all this hit was work out, okay, we've got a particular delivery method to deliver software to people's desktops. Does it work remotely? We've been doing it in the office over the network. Do all of these things work and allow us to install something on somebody's machine when they're uh, sat at home on a possibly a, a weaker bandwidth than they might have been in the office. So we had to start playing with that very quickly and make sure that everything was deliverable remotely. Yeah, it's, it was all a, a huge, literally, organisations, wasn't it? Um, the next question was around, um, and please do post questions to us if you've got anything you want us to answer around this, but technology is only part of this. We know technology can be great and it, um, especially when people's bandwidth goes down or you know power cuts and whatever we, we don't have the contingency in place to support us but I think there's some really good stuff around advice on remote meetings and etiquette in particular that are useful for all of us uh, but absolutely essential for disabled colleagues I think um Darren I'd like to come to you first on this one for your thoughts on those kind of etiquette things or things that work well um or that you've sort of flagged up um that maybe don't work quite so well and some workarounds for them maybe. Yeah, it's, it's funny, it's kind of tagging on a little bit to what Sarah was saying before about lots of people pinging you, you know, when you could be in meetings and things like that. And, and even the etiquette in meetings, it's a face meeting, it would be considered quite rude if half of you started chatting. But yet when you're in a Teams meeting, it's suddenly okay for everybody to have this chat on the side and I've, I've no feel free to chat away on Twitter or whatever, which I still think is maybe I'm old school and a little bit rude. Everybody's looking at their phones and I'm not truly listening. Um, now, when you're using a screen reader like myself, I'm listening with my other sort of earpiece in because I'm using my screen reader technology to, to do stuff. And then I'm hearing this noise going on in the chatter going on in there and then at the same time trying to focus on what you're presenting so i don't want to get rid of that because i know that that's an element that is really useful for people to talk about certain things and, and um, i just think it's how it's managed in, in in the right context um for the discussions and sometimes it can you've moved on to the agenda number three and people are still talking about the, the first one and it, level of moderation is really critical or the way that you moderate meeting is really critical just like it would be I guess in any room but it, it can feel a little bit like a free-for-all ones that we see around videos is a big one so people will quite often say that they prefer everybody to see everybody's faces on there um, and, I, and I think I can totally understand why again for somebody who's visually impaired it's 
you don't have that same level of engagement because if I want to see somebody's face, I have to come close to the screen. That then means that all they can see is the top of my head or the, you know, my right ear or something. And, um, and then vice versa, I then have to put my camera on so they can see me, then I'm way back from the screen. So there's kind of no benefit for me. But again, I understand it because I live in a largely visual world and that's how you have to have to be. But I think, think I would just at the start of the meeting, suggesting that, oh, we all have to turn our cameras on now because that's how we work these days, is forcing your own opinion. Your it might be nice to do that if you're able to do so. And again, other reasons might not permit you because of broadband, etc. So just making people feel comfortable and bearing in mind that, you know, there are different... Um, you know, the different aspects to everyone coming to, to that meeting at that point in time. Yeah, I, 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 sorry. Yeah, go on, Sarah. I just say, I couldn't agree more, Darren. And um, and we've um, thanks to some support actually on the guide on the business disability forum. We've written one about managing remote meetings. Um, and the big thing at the at the beginning of it was um, you know ask people before the meeting. What, do they have any specific needs for that particular meeting yeah. and deal with them before the meeting? So you're absolutely it will not work for another. Um, and it's, it's sort of in the most, in an eloquent way, I suppose, with the right etiquette is um, explaining that Maybe everyone knows how it's going to work. Um, not naming people or pulling anything out, but but advising people of the different ways that they can join, uh, the different ways they can contribute, uh, and and just some of those housekeeping rules, like we've done at the beginning of this, um, I think is absolutely key. Um, and my other big one is is closed captioning. Is explain people how to them how you get the closed captioning on, um, because I think it was Ofcom did a study. Eighty percent of people who use closed captioning actually aren't deaf or hard of hearing so there you know it's a great great piece of technology that can be used by everybody um, and I feel like that's something that we need to shout out a bit more so that it helps lots more people yeah, yeah Neil I, I can tell you want to come in yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'd agree with all of that but one one of the other things is doing asking people before the meeting but ask them long before the meeting if you can because some adjustments take time to prepare for example, if you've got some but the tool you're using happens to use closed captions that are cloud-based and your bit of business doesn't allow you to use that cloud technology for security reasons or whatever, then you might have to get a palantypist in. You have to order a palantypist up front. You have to have them ready to sit in on your meeting. So making sure that you ask in a timely fashion as well before the meeting so that you can make sure that all the um, all the things you put in place are there in time. Absolutely and, and uh, I'm going to come to Michael next as well but one of the things I think is really interesting is with that Darren was talking about at the beginning of this with the chat function so he's taking the audio from the conversation in the, in the meeting and he's getting the chat coming in as well so you're getting that sort of dual like there's too much chat going on there I'm going to switch it off but the chair of the meeting knows that it's important they pick out stuff from that chat yeah. so the etiquette might be that they then make sure that no one's excluded it is around that yeah. absolutely I mean it's 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 a skill right it's in, in moderating meetings and hosting meetings and I, I think it's a completely you know Look skill in terms of you know the importance that it bears onto the people participating in that that session in that event and, and let's not forget some of the meetings can be quite large so it is quite difficult to get to all those people but I think having something I mean, one of the ideas we've toyed around and we still haven't quite got there is having almost like a template that we start with each meeting uh, whether it's kind of one slide thing or whatever but including the invitation, something that gets people in that mode of thinking inclusively around their needs. Thank you, Darren. Michael, can I come to you? What, what's the etiquette that you're noticing that you, or you'd like people to do more of? Oh, um, 
it's 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 kind of interesting where uh, I've already seen is that this is uh, on the one hand people with disabilities kind of have always asked can we work from home and uh, because they face so many barriers coming to the workplace and to start with uh, but there's there are groups out there I think and we mustn't forget that that at work you might have certain adjustments already like bigger screens and all of that kind of stuff where then suddenly you move home and you might not even have a desk or you have to share that desk with a dog, kids, a partner uh, and uh, all of that kind of stuff and that in itself especially I've also seen with uh, people who who uh, are neurodivergent that they actually the mere fact that they would have to work outside of the zone that they normally would work in breaking their routine have that and move to, to your question and move that into uh, where our work days are almost like eight hours if you're lucky, um, because it's often more sedentary, sitting on that, having people with more and more back pain, uh, all of that kind of stuff. I bought myself a gaming chair uh, because ultimately, you know, just to because I'm I know I only have one spine and I, and I need to treat it well, uh, but then. And that is almost linked with that etiquette. What, what I mean, although, for example, we would have all AI helping us, uh, introducing us focus time, helping us, introducing us, hey, why don't we schedule regular lunch breaks for you? Uh, we've had human ingenuity checking your calendar and saying like, oh, but that was just AI plugging in uh, these breaks for you so I can very easily just put a meeting in there or chat to you that was artificial intelligence helping hear you from workplace analytics so that is thing I think the the genuine etiquette needs to go together with let's the technology definitely help you then also have that uh, the manager knowing that resetting priorities for you, leadership, resetting expectations for you, and, and have that hole in a bucket full of, let's be kind to each other and understand that there is no benchmark against what we're currently performing against nothing which has been set yet as a benchmark, right? So I think we're all exceeding to start with, and we do know statistically that people with disabilities will always outperform because uh, as Stas has shown that people with disabilities generally just feel like they they need to be grateful that they have a job and therefore will generally outperform. Uh, so I think you need to kind of see that as a holistic picture. Yeah, I think also, I don't know how many of you find this, you find in one day to another, sometimes you can go from meeting to meeting to meeting and you're like, I just need to go to the toilet and you know, <laughs> grab, refill my water and stuff. And I think, you know, we've kind of got in this set thing of meetings should run on the hour. 10 o'clock sorry start at 10 and finish at 11 um, and then the next one starts at 11 so you're a minute late for that and it's just like this huge knock-on and of course that doesn't really work well for anyone particularly those with disabilities let's start scheduling meetings at five or ten past and finish at five or ten two or quarter two and quarter past i think we kind of need to shift our own mindsets as well on this thing as well and and those features do exist in our yes. and so on yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I was uh, I was presenting earlier today and um, and did exactly that. My meeting started at ten past the hour, and it finished at ten to the hour. Um, but the other thing to think about is content for the time you've got, because if you cram your talk really quickly, people who need more thinking and processing time are going to get lost in your meeting so you need to be able to fit in what you need to fit in in the time that it takes without lose it and also because it helps closed captions if you're having automatic closed captions done um, if you can talk more slowly and clearly which is always something I struggle with I'll be honest I always talk too quickly and it's made me remember to speak a little slower <laughs> But, but, but that's then where it gets really interesting if you then also record the meeting and then Teams now, I don't know if everybody has it yet, where you have this automatic transcribing with uh, speaker attribution. I, 
nobody wants to miss a full meeting and then be punished to end the evening or in the weekends <laughs> have that hour of video playing again. I, I, I would love to do a slider. Who does that? Who watches the full meeting? Description with speaker attribution, you know, if you miss a meeting or you have to do a, a call of nature, etc., you can quickly check up and, and read the text and say, okay, Lucy said this then and then, and then Neil said that. And the track. Uh, and, and that's where the, that speaker attribution with the speaker notes uh, is, is also helping that kind of asynchronous working styles. It's a, it's a productivity thing, right? Mm. You know, I, I completely agree with what you're saying, Michael, because, like you said, if you've missed a meeting, there's a good reason why you did that. And then begin to add to your backlog of meetings now that I'm supposed to go and watch. And let's face it, probably out of an hour, there's probably about 15 minutes that are worthwhile of really hearing the, the key points that come out of it, apart from this session, of course. Um, so I, I think that having somebody, again, who, who's managing that and saying, here here's the key items that we discussed, here's the actions and, and given it's the transcript, if you can do that, is, is a good um, approach to take as well. Yeah, it becomes searchable then as well, sorry, yeah. That's right, I was going to say, and of course, those transcripts and captions that you've already referred to, Michael, are all online. So that sort of allowed us to give people those options. So if they want to like watch us and then read it all back through, then it's like a double whammy, really, isn't it? Life couldn't really get much better. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to the, the next question I've got. Again, if anyone's got any questions for us, please do dive in. We'd love to hear from you and, and have you get involved. So we talked a little bit around the etiquette of the meetings, um, but what else do colleagues need to think about in terms of accessibility when they're creating content and documents, etc.? cetera? Um, are there some simple mistakes that people make um, and how can we help them to get better? Michael, I'm going to come to you first, being our Microsoft accessibility guru. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, uh, I think that's Hector and all the champions, and then I just uh, pitch in. Uh, you know, uh, still the favourite is very much you don't know where your content is going to land, uh, and actually, for the first time, uh, we are really very digitally connected, right? Uh, so, check her in our platform, which is. Uh, pretty much everywhere do, do use that. I mean, um, because even there, it could be a colleague who will then need to pass it on. And again, I always say, I always shock horror people with saying, surely we got disabled employees, surely we got disabled customers. Uh, would you want to suddenly have to fix that? No, absolutely not. You want your content to be read because otherwise you would know of creators. So use the accessibility checker. Um, and uh, yeah, we already mentioned kind of the, the, the practice of recording. Uh, so then you can check things again, that the, even the notes. I mean, even for me, I would want to see my, my recording back. Uh, but <laughs> My, my actions that I promised and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, so those are the kind of things that I would uh, recommend um, to think about making sure. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Sarah, can I come to you? I was going to say, yeah, thank you to Microsoft. I was probably trying to get the message out there to people that they needed to uh, design more accessible digital content. Uh, and, and it used to be quite difficult in terms of going through all some of the rules, whereas actually when we introduced the accessibility checker and we said, oh, just click on this, it's actually prompted them to go, oh, well, what is alt text? Oh, right, okay, that's what you mean by alt text in your images. Okay, well, what's color contrast? Oh, okay, this is how I check. And we then we put a color contrast analyzer tool in, how do you check for that? Um, what's, and, and Darren probably um, may want to talk about this, I don't know, but um, what's reading order in PowerPoint? I've never even heard of that. What, 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 why, did, why is that so important? But for me, that accessibility checker enabled us those things were, and it brought it to the forefront of their mind, actually, which has been really helpful. Um, but there's other things, you know, like hyperlinks, making sure that they, they are informative and, and obviously using simple language as well. Is, is, is that they would be the key things for me that I've been trying to get the message out for for a while and it's helped. Yeah, I think the accessibility checker has been 
massive. In fact, just an hour uh, an hour ago, I was sat with a small group of people explaining to them about how their recent messages around all the things that were happening on the lead up to Christmas, um, all it said to me, and I actually went on and shared my screen reader with them and said, look, here's the message. So I said, hello, read the following, and then it just gave me their email signature, right? So there was an image in the middle that had everything in it, apparently. Um, so, you, you know, I, I kind of said, look, we don't want to recognize that visual aspects are important and you know, having these kind of digital posters are key to kind of drawing people into things but you also need to be creative about your accessibility as well and now in fairness there's nothing really about the accessibility checker even though we have been trying to promote it but you know you can't get everybody all the time and so they, they were genuinely interested in, in what these things are and just trying to explain then that this isn't just you know, for me to read this. This is for people who um, say so it's people with dyslexia, people who prefer things just written in plain English as well for you to be able to interpret that well. Sometimes the colors that you're using will not work well with people with color blindness, um, using shapes and patterns when you've got things like graphs and symbols, you know, when you, you're trying to give some people a, an indicator of a status or something. Um, there is a whole bunch of checker is, is one really good way to start just building a habit around it. I think the other thing that I, I like that Microsoft have, have introduced is this uh, ability to um, basically about to send you a message that, hey, I'd like my content to be sent in um, an accessible way, you know, so it, it's basically something you can put in your settings that when somebody puts put, includes me in their toolbox, it comes up saying this person, you know, requires accessible content. Um, ironically, the other day, somebody thought it was really cool and then sent me the screenshot back of it saying, hey, I've just seen this on your message <laughs> and didn't all tag it. <laughs> so I was like, what did you see? And they were like, the thing that I sent you. I was like, okay, yeah. we need to do some more work on this. But, you know, it is great. The, it's really the education other, piece, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the other important thing about all of this is it's all well and good being able to check everything for access. You should start with the right tool in the first place, the right tool for the job. For example, yeah. I, I see so many reports that are written in PowerPoint. And you think, why? It's a report. Why don't you write it in Word? Something accessible in Word than it is in PowerPoint. Um, you know, you can make things accessible in both. It just takes longer in PowerPoint. So um, if you're going to write a report, write it in Word. You can still put pictures in it. You can still make it look nice. But, you know, use the right tool for the job. And if you're going to PDF something at the end of the day, then make sure you've made the root document accessible in the first place because that takes away 90 percent of the work you have to do in adobe afterwards to make the pdf accessible yeah thank you for we're that, going yeah. to disagree with me on something <laughs> a little bit i mean in powerpoint you can use accessible i, I love powerpoint uh and i used to, um so with my dyspraxia, it could take ages to it used to take ages to get something just right the way I wanted. Um, but with PowerPoint Designer, I can just say I could just make all my slides with the pertinent accessible because what what is inaccessible about a wide slide and the pertinent points pretty much nothing. <laughs> Everything is accessible on that sense. I mean, so and then I asked PowerPoint Designer to to make it look pretty and and and. The, the what is generate then um i if it has a picture i know i know, need to use the, the checker and and describe the picture or i can make a decorative but um so i guess what i'm trying to say it's um if you start from powerpoint and start from an accessible template then you know and you start and i have been using accessibility checker for for a while so that kind of self educates you then you know when you start adding specific stuff is like Okay, I need to do. Yeah, um, so it's that. I I I know you are 
perfectly correct me, but I want to step away from the people who think like, ooh, so if I want to be accessible, I'm less artistic. I just, no, just want to be like close to that. Work, that's all. Yeah, okay. For example, if, if you've got a single column on a PowerPoint slide, but it's made up of two text boxes, yeah. and you've got a single column in Word made up of lots of paragraphs of text in word it will read a screen reader will read it from top to bottom in the order that it sees it in powerpoint it will read the first text box that you put on the slide so if you've changed your mind and shuffled the order of those text boxes you then have to tell it the reading order which you wouldn't have had to do in word in a single column so yes they're both accessible both perfectly good products you just have to do a bit more work in one than yeah. the other and just don't take a screenshot of the word document and put it as an image on the powerpoint deck in trouble. <laughs> Interesting conversations and it does sort of show I think if you're a visual thinker or you find it easier to put that stuff down creatively rather than as text um, which could be the case for anyone discussion but I think that accessibility checker is probably one of the key things there. Um, we've had a, a question through um, from uh, Warren on the chat there and uh, he wondered where the what the panel thought responsibility lies to help accommodate the changes we face moving to a working from home environment. Should employers be more responsible for the employees well-being providing desk chairs screens and stuff to help adapt or does the responsibility lie with the employee? Um, Sarah, can I come to you on this one? Because I know at NatWest uh, you were quite reactive to, to your employees. Um, if you're able to share that, sorry, I've just ultimately picked on you there. So uh... No, no, I was just wondering if you can repeat the question because there you go, my neurodiverse, I can't see it in front of me. Yeah, but, um... no, that's fine. So you wondered uh, what um, adjustments for your employees, should employers be responsible for providing the equipment or should it sit with the employee? Oh, I'm going to be on the fence here and say both. Um, I do think um, the company has a responsibility to look after the welfare of their employees. Absolutely. Uh, in terms of, and we're, and we're very big on well-being, particularly at the moment. Um, and our CEO stood up and said, can everyone please go and take some fresh air during the daylight hours? Um, and I will be telling my exec team to do the same thing. Um, but I also do think there's a responsibility on the individual as well. Um, so for example, I definitely have had um, a bit more running. I've got a knee injury, my back's hurting a little bit more. I think it's probably because I've reached that age, but you never know. But I have that responsibility to look after myself um, go and seek support from whether it's the GP, whether it's a physio, responsible for me and I need to look after myself in the best possible way I can um, but likewise if my work environment is um, making uh, me more unhealthy or not supporting me in the way my ability to, to highlight that to the organization and say please can I have some support here with the right chair or if it's a physical thing or um, if you've been to the GP and they've diagnosed you with um, you know maybe after an accident or whatever this is what my GP said I really need please can you support me in getting this equipment or software or whatever that may be but I would say both uh, and I think I'm con particularly concerned at COVID times that people aren't necessarily seeking the support that they might need actually and I think we all need to take responsibility for saying actually I've recognised something's got worse during this time and, and go to the GP and, and always ask for support really is what I'd say. No, that, that's useful. I think you're right. I think there is an element if you need them. And this working from home wasn't just the three week thing we were sort of talking about at the beginning of this. It's sort of just continued and merged, hasn't it? But I think there is definitely a, unless you talk or share that things are maybe you're struggling, whether it's your mental because your setup hasn't been right, you need to share that and talk about it or talk about what the issues might be in order for your employee to put solutions in place. Neil, did you want to come in on that? I picked on you because you done muted yourself, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it, I absolutely agree with Sarah. It's definitely a two-way street and the individual is responsible for looking after themselves and the employer is responsible for a certain amount of that as well. So <clears throat> from an employer's perspective, 
not only should you be able to provide the assisted technology they might need and the particular um, tools that they need to do the job, um, but also you need to provide them with the knowledge of how to look after themselves. You need to provide that says, this is how I set myself up in a home environment. This is the height of my screen that I should be looking at. This is my seating uh, that I should be looking at. So you need to educate the workforce as well to say, they might be sat on the edge of your bed, hunched over a laptop uh, for 15 hours a day, because that's not going to do anyone any good. So it's definitely a two way street and you do need to be able to, to agree with each other that one's going to do a certain amount and it's down to the other to do their bit as well. Thanks for that, Neil. Michael, did you want to say something? We, we had a, a, a now a three-pronged approach uh, very rapidly when this started. Um, the, it appears, because I'm not in the leadership, it, it felt genuinely that the leadership team got together and say, how are we going to manage this and what, what are the things that we need to to, to really focus on. And they genuinely focused on the employee's well-being and, and very rapidly they put schemes in place so people could get the uh, uh, office equipment at home and that could be uh, bigger screens, that could be US. very rapidly that was established. Uh, it was then very amazing that uh, as the ERG, we saw all the guidelines and there were some things that we still said, maybe you could tweak this and tweak this. And, and, and again, that within the hour that we gave that input, they, they changed it to make sure that uh, it had our input in, in the guidelines as well, which were already very accommodating. The second level of help is then, of course, we got the centralised funding for reasonable adjustments. Uh, and in the UK, we had that. So there is that level as well to have stuff on top of what was already generally provisioned to all employees but now and this is nobody uh, i think not many microsoft employees know this yet as a benefits package to be able to keep things permanently outside of what i just discussed we are also going to provide uh, gym equipment uh, chair economic chairs and or at a lesser price as a, as a benefits package. Uh, so really looking, you know, looking long term here. Uh, and, and this is going to be announced in a couple of weeks. I probably shouldn't be doing this, but they can hear it. Uh, if they're listening to this, they will be hearing it here first. So, so yeah, this is kind of a three, three prompt approach here. I love it. Michael Vermeesh, the bearer of good news. I'm, I'm loving that. Um, <laughs> Never tell Michael a secret, noted. Uh, Darren, did you want to come in on this at all? <laughs> I, I just, just wonder if it comes with a minibar option as well for those people less inclined to do ah. the, uh, <laughs> the uh, gym stuff. But, um, you know, just thinking of being inclusive, that's all. Um, so I guess my view is... Um, you are working permanently from home, that's where I'm coming from on this one, then... I think absolutely the, the employer does have a responsibility to make sure that they've got, um, you know, a festival with all the ergo things that they need. So they're kind of, you know, furnishing some things like that. But I think most people would probably, if they were, if they're already wanting to push for that, they would think that they've got a, a good place to, to continue to work from home from, because I think many people who, who aren't in that position, you know, that's why they, one of the reasons why, you know, the office is still their, their preference. Um, I mean, I personally, I've got my large screen provider through my company and obviously my laptop, which is, you know, used anywhere and, and some other bits and pieces, but my furniture is my own. Um, but I do think that one of the things that we could sometimes do a better job of is just explaining what you can and can't have um, because quite often it feels to me that people are willing to accommodate and provide things but it can always you know has anybody asked for this before kind of feeling 
Whereas I think, you know, if you're up front and clear about it, this is what we can have. Now, I, I guess the people are worried then that you're going to open up the, uh, you know, open up the door to all sorts of requests. But, you know, that's where your clear policy and, and um, procedure should come in around these things, just like any adjustments. Thanks for that, Diana. I'm just going to go to another question we've had, and it's from uh, one of our Tech Task Force uh, members. Um, who is also one of our co-chairs, uh, Paul Smythe. And he's asking, what extra challenges do businesses need to work through thinking about disabled colleagues working from home longer term, as well as how offices of the future will become more collaborative? Now, I'm gonna ignore the future because that's in the next panel. So um, I think there is an issue around people working from home though, um, and about people maybe acquiring disabilities because they feel the need to be glued to a computer screen. Um, is this something that you're finding? Uh, it's, <laughs> the longer this goes on and the longer people are stuck in a home environment when they don't necessarily want to be, um, then certainly it's not helping with um, several mental health issues. It's not helping with um, all, all manner of, of cognitive issues that seem to be getting worse if people are feeling trapped in a home environment that's not ideal for them and I think we need to make sure that uh, again we've got uh, resources in place for people to talk to to people find out um, alternatives how they can get out of certain situations what they can do to make themselves feel better as well as work better so um, you need to have different formats and, and different uh, contact points and people need to know that if they are having to be in this work environment for a long period of time, uh, that there are things that we can and you need to, to talk about it. But also having the offer to say, well, when we open up the offices again, um, those who need to, who feel they want to, should be able to come back to the office whenever you want. Um, and those who are comfortable at home, so long as we're happy that you are uh, in a health and safety situation, then you can stay there as long as you like. So. I'd agree with that. I think there's a big thing about choice here, isn't there? Um, uh, and obviously, hopefully when we're out of lockdown too and we're into the future, um, the learnings from this is, is about choice. And, and technology has been, and I don't think we should take away, absolutely amazing um, from this perspective and enabled us to connect. I think about how my homes it's serving uh, and how we've been able to do videos like this and Tech Chef Pro remotely. It, it's been fantastic in that respect. And then from an AT perspective, um, you know, we've enabled a lot remotely, which is we couldn't have done 10 years ago. You know, it's been brilliant. But the big takeaway would be choice for people. I think um, disability or no disability, there should be a choice about um, what work you do, not where you work. So if you are struggling to get into the office for a disability reason, you should have a choice to be able to work at home more because and the technology shouldn't be a barrier. It now enables you to do that. Um, so that that would be my big thing for um, for how this what, what we could learn from this. And, you know, as, as Paul question answers, you know, slightly about the future, but but also um, how can we make this better at the current time? Well, now we've got a flurry of questions. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna move on very quickly because we're running out of time. I knew this would happen. They all come at the end, don't they? Someone's asked as an employee um, and someone who arranges online meetings, um, what should I be making sure I'm doing as we move to virtual meetings to make sure they're inclusive? Now, I think we've covered some of that off. So I think there's a big thing around asking require something uh, require you to do something so that they can get the most out of the meeting so some of that is around the way you frame it I think isn't it um, and being inclusive and just open to say please tell me how I can help you to get the best out of this meeting simple language like that we can be quite positive I think and enables people to have an open conversation without it feeling like a, a special I'm doing fingers there special a special adjustment for them um, any other quick thoughts on on that just offering think, choice. Yeah, choice. Yeah. It keeps coming up, doesn't it? The choice word. I think um, framing, like you said, is, is really key to any of these meetings. It's difficult because you never know the size of a meeting. And 
it, it's a it's a difficult thing to sort of say well in this setting you must do this but i think having a good idea of the types of things that can work well for a, a wide variety of people and and kind of almost framing sometimes your meetings with that, it's reminding people, like Sarah said, that there's closed captions could be available in this platform by doing this. Or as there's a lot of people on the call, not everybody can see everybody on there. So if you don't mind just saying your name, if, if you've got a point to make, because that's quite useful, and, and those kind of things. So it's, uh, you know, there's little tidbits of things that you can bring into the start of any meeting that gets people thinking about that and building those habits. Yeah, I'm going to move us on um, because we are going to run out of time. Even things like letting people know captions are available. I think all those things send out that cultural message to say we care about inclusivity and we want everyone to be a part of this can be really important. OK, a last question for all of you, if we can um, cover this off with some. It's probably two minutes, to be fair, I'd like to finish on time. Uh, what lasting benefits would you like us to maintain from the last eight months where everything's been turned upside down? Uh, because let's be honest, some of it has actually been quite good. There's been some benefits from this. I'm going to come to you first. What, what quickly would um, you like us to hold on to? Business case for working from home. It's been made a nonsense and not needed anymore, which is great. Disabled staff often had to build a case for not being present in the office, and, and it's finally been seen that it doesn't matter where you are physically, so long as you can do the work. Perfect. And we did actually a big workplace adjustment survey last year, and that was the most requested um, adjustment from uh, employees. So, yeah, fantastic, Neil. Sarah, can I come to you, please? Totally agree with Neil. Um, Organisations have more confidence that this is going to work now. Um, and then I'll go back to my choice one, you know, give that choice. So people who've got um, disabilities that cause pain, um, neurodiverse prefer to work in quieter environments so they can be at home. That choice to work. Thanks, Sarah. Michael, can I come to you? I think uh, consider now definitely virtual or digital for anything with regards to disability inclusion, be it employment, be it uh, uh, and museum vid visits, whatever. Uh, we've now shown that we can do this uh, via a different way. Thanks, Michael. And Darren, to you last. Last word, nearly. Authenticity and openness. I think that we've been allowed into, you know, our leaders, homes into everybody's homes in a way and you know there's good and bad sides to that but the positive side of it is that i think people have become much more open uh in, in discussing things generally especially around mental health and I've, I've also been more relaxed in a sense that oh i don't quite know how to do this um so i'll just apologize for that and it doesn't have to be this kind of big you have to use all this technology and the PowerPoint thing at the same time, and people are just open about it, and other people then help each other out more because of that. So I think that's been really cool. Fantastic. Um, that just leads me to say thank you ever so much to Darren for joining us today, and thanks for your questions. Sorry we didn't get a chance to answer them all. I'll be back in about 10 minutes for another session. Um, thank you ever so much for joining us. Take care. Bye bye.